God who creates, redeems, and sanctifies. Amen. Amen. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack nothing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. <coughs> when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. In the Apple television series, Loot, Maya Rudolph plays the character of Molly Wells, a woman who lives an extravagant, ultra-luxury life with her husband, a Silicon Valley tech entrepreneur whose business she helps start. When Molly discovers his adultery, she divorces him, resulting in an $87 billion settlement that makes her the third richest woman in the world. After a wild post-divorce trip around the globe, she's called in for a meeting with the executive director of the charitable foundation that she founded eight years earlier and then promptly forgot about. She's informed that her behavior is a bad look for charity and that their work is suffering because of it. Faced with this, Molly decides that she needs to get more involved. And along the way, she discovers that this work gives new purpose to her life. But of course, being a sitcom, uh, she makes many mistakes, hilarious and cringeworthy, along the way. Take, for example, at a ribbon cutting ceremony, the Foundation's new women's shelter. First, she orders uh, an Uber fleet of $100,000 SUVs for the staff to arrive in style. Then, during her speech to the press and the occupants of the shelter, she says, Now, I have never personally been unhoused, but there was that one summer when they were doing construction on our New York home, and I had to stay at the plaza. At the end of those three weeks, I felt like I was getting out of Shawshank, the prison. <laughs> Toward the end of the first season, having deviated from her foundation's social mission of housing and homelessness, she invests $3 billion dollars and a high-tech water treatment program that goes disastrously wrong in front of a live audience of fellow billionaire investors who are gathered for a conference to talk about their big ideas to change the world. To save face and try to recoup her investment, Molly drinks a glass of what is supposed to be crystal clear water, but that remains grotesquely brown and murky. Of course, she gets ill. And it is undoubtedly a metaphor for the entire show. The things we so often think will save us, money, power, influence, are not the solutions they promise to be. Humiliated, Molly has a breakthrough. The world does not need her big idea, or for that matter, the big ideas of any of the billionaires gathered there, any of these would-be saviors. What the world needs is less money in billionaire bank accounts and more share. She tells her peers that they are the problem. No one should have as much money as any one of them does. She announces that from that day forward, she's going to make it her mission in life to give away all of her money and help as many people as she can. The second season starts by showing that giving away billions of dollars is not as easy as it sounds. To start with, Molly's wealth continues to grow exponentially. Each day, she has more and more to give away. Not surprisingly, she also runs the resistance from her billionaire peers who are not quite as willing as she is to give up their privileges. And as it turns out, maybe Molly isn't ready either, because her downsized home is still a beautiful mansion on the beach. But the important thing is that Molly is changing. She and her charity learn along the way how important it is to listen, to listen to those they are trying to serve, and to work with communities to achieve big goals together, not just alone. In today's Gospel reading, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus encounters a rich man who comes to him for guidance. The man seems quite earnest. He, he wants to know how to find eternal life. Jesus says, you know the commandments. And then he starts quoting from the Decalogue. Jesus seems to imply that following these laws will lead the rich man to eternal life. The man replies that he has obeyed all of these commandments his whole life. What happens next is striking to be poignant. 
We read, Jesus looking at him, loved him, and said, you lack one thing. We could read this as Jesus being judgmental, but I really think that's the wrong reading. And Jesus does not condemn the man for his wealth. He looks closely at him, and he loves him. And I wonder, have any of you ever been looked at so intently by someone that you felt exposed and vulnerable, but not in a threatening way, but in a way that leaves you feeling completely known and accepted? Completely loved. To be loved is vulnerable, after all. I think that's how Jesus looked at this man. He affirmed him. Yes, you are a good person. You're doing good things. You're working really hard. But here's what you can do to take it to the next level. It's not a condemnation. It's a challenge, an invitation, a calling. One the man can choose to accept or not. Jesus knows, I do believe, he knows that this man has it within himself to take on this hard task. But we read that the man walks away, shocked and grieving, for he had no possessions. The usual interpretation is that he couldn't do it, that he did not, in the end, join the Jesus movement because it was too hard for him, what Jesus asked him to do. But the thing is, none of the gospel accounts actually say that. We don't actually know what happens next. Maybe the man gets home and decides to go through with it. After all, maybe he's so shocked and grieving in that moment because he knows actually right then and there what he's going to do, but he needs to go home and make arrangements rather than leaving his life immediately. So we might ask, why did Jesus ask this of this particular man? He had other followers who had means who did not ask to give it all away. But it seems clear that here, we can use at least this one person's wealth as an impediment to prioritizing the kingdom of God. So if we look at the original Greek of the New Testament, we might gain some additional insight into what's going on. First off, let's notice that the rich man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That word in Greek, inherit, as actually means just that, to inherit. Uh, sometimes it means something a little slightly different, but this time it means just that. And one commentator notes that it refers to a transfer of property and possessions from one generation to another, usually within a family or clan, and usually upon the death of the owner. The word has an implication of a legitimate historic right, the objects inherited. So what an interesting word, isn't it? What an interesting word for the man to use to talk about eternal life. What must I do to inherit? eternal life. Inherit implies that eternal life is something one deserves by right. In this case, not by a family legacy, but by the covenant of following the law as God has passed down to the people. And indeed, this is part of the understanding of the ancient covenant. In Deuteronomy, God says, see, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. I call on heaven and earth to witness against you today, and I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, choose life. As he had been taught, the rich man shows life by following the commandments, but he still felt something was missing. That's why I went to Jesus. So let's look again at what he's asking for. Eternal life. The word translated as eternal, eon, literally means a long time. And it's also the name of a deity who is associated with time, the zodiac, and the universe. Eon's time is cyclical, and the deity is often represented with a circle or an orb. And in classical thought, a circle or sphere is a symbol of perfection, of completeness. So I think it says to us, the man is asking Jesus what he can do to find a complete life, a full life, the life God intends for him. But Jesus' response indicates the man misunderstands. A full, abundant life is not something that one inherits 
by way of following commandments, even really important ones. It is instead something one experiences by transformation of the heart. I believe that Jesus had confidence in this man that he would experience the transformation he sought if he did what he asked and gave away everything and devoted his life to others. It was not, though, intended by Jesus to be a requirement to enter heaven. I think that is a total misreading of this text. But it is instead an invitation to experience the fullness of life that the man sought, the abundant life of the kingdom of God, the reign of God. The good news for us here today is that the life, that life in God is not something we can earn or inherit, but it is something we can participate in. God invites us into a transformation of the heart, and that is how we participate in the kingdom of God. Sometimes events might happen to us that bring us to a moment of conversion, like Saul on the road to Damascus, blinded by the light. But more often, we are given the chance to accept the invitation and participate, moment by moment, in acts of service and kindness that make up the fullness of life that is the eternal reign of God. True, we would no doubt experience major transformation if we decided to do as Jesus asked the rich man to do and gave away all his possessions. But before we take that step, I think we need to start by opening our hearts and giving away our love. After all, isn't that what the man's wealth represents? Where one's heart is, there one's treasure is. This is what he values enough to grieve over. And so it's about misprioritized values, Mis, uh, misprioritizing what is most important in life. And so instead of focusing only on Jesus' uh, suggestion to give away his wealth, what if we looked at it a different way and read it this way? Jesus, looking at us, loves us and says, you lack one thing. Go share what has been given to you and give your love to all. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. Maybe so. Amen.